Well, today uh, we begin uh, a brand new series, and uh, the series is entitled, Why I Believe. And some of the topics are why I believe in life after death, why I believe in the Bible, why I believe in creation, uh, why I believe in God, why I believe in Jesus, and today it is why I believe in the resurrection. And our scripture today is found in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and we're going to be reading verses 12 through 19. But tell me this, since you believe what we preach, that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that dead people will never come back to life again? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ must still be dead. And if he is still dead, then all our preaching is useless, and your trust in God is empty, worthless, hopeless. And we apostles are all liars because we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. And of course, that isn't true if the dead do not come back to life again. If they don't, then Christ is still dead. And you are very foolish to keep on trusting God to save you. And you are still under condemnation for your sins. In that case, all Christians who have died are lost. And if we being a Christian is of value to us only now in this life, we are the most miserable of creatures. That's the reading of our scripture today. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I think it's a good question, and I believe if you lined up 10 people and asked them this question, you might get 10 different answers. But let me run by the question for you today. The question is, what is the worst thing that could happen to all of us? Now, we might say what's going on today, and of course that's true with this virus worldwide. I mean, it is touching all of us, but I'm sure you might have had another answer to that question. I personally think I have the right answer. If there's such a thing as the right answer to one question, but I believe this is the answer. If we really would think about it, and it's our title of our message today, if there is no resurrection from the dead. That's the worst thing that could happen to all of us. Think about that now. If there was no resurrection, there's no hope. There's no hope at all. No hope for a better here and now, and no hope for any there and then. No hope for eternal life. Now, in our scripture today, Paul said, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then what? And he names four things. Number one, preaching will be useless. Two, our faith is futile. Three, then sin controls. And four, then Christ died. So let's look at them very closely, one at a time. If there is no uh, resurrection, then preaching is useless. A man told his boss that he was called to be a preacher, so he resigned his job. But he was back two weeks later, asking for his old job back. And the boss said, I thought you were called by God to preach. And the man said, yes, I was. But that was before the Lord heard me preach. Well, I remember in seminary, I can remember a teacher saying, I think preaching is useless most of the time anyway. And I thought, and I asked him, how could you say that? How could that be? And I remember him saying, because we are pretty good listeners, but poor doers. We are not good responders to God's word. We often say nothing and do nothing. We may not even hear what is being preached. And even when we do, 
we do nothing about it. We are not very good doers of the word. Rick Warren. Rick Warren's church, uh, the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, runs around 25,000 or more every weekend in six different services. And they are doing more than many churches. Joel Olstein's church, the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, runs over 40,000 every weekend. <laughs> In seven services, I believe. They may even have more than 40,000. It's probably the uh, largest church in America. The Southeast Christian Church of Louisville, Kentucky, grew from 135 a Sunday to over 18,000 a Sunday in 40 years with Bob Russell as their senior minister. They've had nearly 30,000 people just for Easter services. And there are a host of other churches across the United States that run anywhere from 10 to 20,000 in attendance every week. But it all means nothing. It all means nothing if we hear but we do not do. And it all means nothing if there is no resurrection. Think about that. If there's no resurrection from the dead, it means nothing. All preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is useless if there's no resurrection. The second thing, if there is no resurrection, then faith is futile. In a... Um, ecumenical worship service, a Baptist minister told the story about another certain Baptist minister delivering a sermon, and the sermon ends with a question. How many of you, he asks, are down-to-earth, loyal, born-again Baptists? Well, every person in the congregation raises his or her hand except one woman, a Methodist. Well, immediately the preacher tries to talk her into joining the Baptist church. Don't you realize, he says, that unless you are born again and immersed in the waters of baptism, that you may not be saved. The woman stood firm. She says, my great-grandparents were Methodists, my grandparents were Methodists, and my parents were Methodists. Well, this upset the Baptist preacher. That's a very poor argument, he replies. What would you be if your great-grandparents and grandparents and parents had been idiots? To which she replied, then I'd be a Baptist, I guess. <laughs> well, our faith in the Lord should make a difference in our lives. That is, in what we do and how we live, whether if we're Baptist or Methodist. And in our giving, too. You think, what? Yes. Our giving. Our giving is a matter of faith. We live in a time when many people claim to be followers of Christ, but they don't give back to God. Not even one penny. Why don't they give? I think probably it's just a lack of faith. Hasn't the Lord not given everything to us in the first place? Jobs and houses, and cars, and televisions, you name it, you know, are not all of these gifts from God. But what if we don't give back to God? It's a sign that our faith is very weak, and that we don't trust God to care for us in the future. However, faith says, I not only believe in the Lord, I also trust the Lord to take care of me materially. He has in the past, he will in the future. Now that's living by faith. So listen, listen carefully. All the faith in the world will mean nothing if there is no resurrection from the dead. Third, if there is no resurrection, then sin controls. I remember hearing about one preacher announced that there are 726 different sins. 
What happened when he did that? He was hounded for that list of sins by people who thought they were missing out on something. Some days, it does seem like sin controls us. Like sin gets the upper hand. It's true. I know it's true for me. And I imagine it's true for you as well. Everyone gets hounded by some kind of sin. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15? Remember Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, do you remember what happened to that young prodigal son? Not after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, then squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him out to feed his pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. Now what should we call his sin? Sin of the flesh? Probably. Yes, indeed. He indulged himself with what we would call today wine, women, and song. But the prodigal son wasn't the only sinner in the story. There was the elder or older brother. Now, what did he do that was so wrong? I mean, he never left home. He never wasted any money in wild living. So what did he do that was so sinful? He was totally self-righteous and indignant. He saw himself as being holier than thou and holier than his younger brother. And he was angry. His sin was the sin of disposition, and often the sin of the disposition is far worse than the other. Why? Why is it harder to, it's harder to overcome. They are harder to repent from that. So what's your big sin? What's your big sin? Whatever that sin is, it means nothing if there is no resurrection from the dead. So some people say, hey, go ahead, you know, indulge yourself, do whatever you want. But if there is a resurrection from the dead, then we are accountable. So you might want to think twice about indulging yourself. And then finally, if there is no resurrection, then Christ is dead. Do you believe in life after death? A boss asked one of his employees. Yes, sir, the new recruit replied. Well, then that makes everything just fine, the boss went on. After you left early yesterday to go to your grandmother's funeral, she stopped by to see you. A singing group called The Resurrection was scheduled to sing at a church. Then a big snowstorm postponed the performance. So the pastor went out and changed the outside message board and it read, the resurrection is postponed. What if the resurrection was postponed? No. Worse. What if there was no resurrection? Remember verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then everyone who has passed away is dead and gone. And even Christ did not rise from the dead. Even he is dead and gone. Wow. Mark Twain. Mark Twain became very weary and depressed shortly before his death. And he wrote, A multitude of men are born. They labor and sweat and struggle. They squabble and scold and fight. They scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them, 
infirmities follow, those they love are taken from them, and the joy of life is turned to aching grief. It, the release, comes at last. The only unpoisoned gift earth ever had for them, and they vanish from a world where they were of no consequence, a world which will lament them a day and forget them forever. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? That sounds pretty sad. And death can be pretty sad for many people. I can remember one time going to the funeral home and and I saw a lady there and she went in to view her deceased husband's body as he passed away very suddenly. And I stood in the back of the chapel and she peered into the coffin to see her husband and she suddenly just broke down and she started weeping and wailing loudly. And I remember finally in desperation, she said, would somebody please pray? She didn't know what to do except to ask for prayer. And I don't believe that she and her husband had gone to church much at all. But she was grabbing for whatever she could find, some help and hope. Raymond Lindquist said, Easter, I love this, Easter is to our faith what water is to the ocean, what stone is to the mountain, what blood is to your body. It is the first and final word in the dictionary of God. It says that Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. And the bottom line in all of this is, We either believe the biblical record or we don't. Professional golfer Paul Azinger was diagnosed with cancer when he was only 33 years old. He had just won a PGA championship and he already had 10 victories to his credit. And he wrote, A genuine feeling of fear came over me. I could die from cancer. Then another reality hit me even harder. I'm going to die eventually anyway, whether from cancer or something else. It's just a question of when. Everything I had accomplished in golf became meaningless to me. All I wanted to do was live. Then he remembered something that Larry Moody, who teaches a Bible study on the tour, had said to him. And I think this is so powerful. He said, Zinger, we're not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We're in the land of the dying trying to get to the land of the living. Azinger recovered with chemotherapy and returned to the PGA Tour. And he's done pretty well. He's earned nearly $14.5 million in his career. But the bout with cancer deepened his perspective. And he said, I've made a lot of money since I've been on the tour. And I've won a lot of tournaments. But that happiness is always temporary. The only way you will ever have true contentment is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that nothing ever bothers me and I don't have problems, but I feel like I found the answer to that six-foot hole. Beloved, Jesus is the only answer to that six-foot hole. Believe it. Not only that, live it. Amen.